Today, whether you are liberal or conservative, whether you're independent or moderate, or whether you're just checked out, what I want to do is challenge the way you think about the climate change problem. In 2012, more than 45,000 people flew to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and they flew there to, ce to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the first major climate agreement. But no new agreement emerged from the Rio conference. In fact, the international process is in gridlock, and the national domestic process is as well. But what I want to argue today is something very important did happen at Rio a few years ago, and that was a set of private commitments by corporations, nonprofit groups, and advocacy groups to reduce carbon emissions even without government action. Dell committed to reduce its emissions by 30% by the year 2015. Microsoft, which has operations in 100 countries around the world, committed to go carbon neutral. And what I want to argue is that these commitments are a signal of something very important and something very new, and that's private environmental governance. What we're seeing is private institutions playing the roles that we typically expect government to play, reducing pollution, protecting natural resources. And what's happening is that this is providing us with an opportunity to begin to buy a decade of carbon emissions reductions. Now, if you're like most American audiences, right, about half of you either don't really think humans are causing climate change, or if we are causing climate change, you're more worried about a big government solution than you are about the problem itself. But the beauty of a private governance response is that it can begin to bypass that problem. It can tell us something about the climate science, which I'll talk about in just a minute, but it can also begin to buy a decade of carbon emissions reductions. And if you look at this black line at the top, what you see is the global CO2 emissions, given what governments are likely to do. And you see that they're going up steeply. If you look at the red line, what you see is where we need to be to avoid the most severe effects of climate change. We don't know that this is a safe level, but how many of you have a tachometer on your car? Right? So exceeding that red level is like driving your car down the highway in the red zone on your tachometer. You don't know that your engine will freeze up, but the chance that it will rises steeply. So what can we do even in this era of government gridlock? And the answer is that if we assume that government won't do very much over the next decade, from 2016 to 2025, we can nevertheless buy a decade of carbon emissions, that wedge that you see up there. And how can we get that? We can get that by reducing between 2,000 and 3,000 million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. And private governance holds an option to do that. Now, you might ask, well, why don't we just wait for government to act? And what you see up here is that we had more than a dozen major pollution control statutes between 1970 and 1990. How many of you know how many we've had since 1990? Right? Uh, my clicker isn't failing, right? We've had none. No major pollution control statutes since 1990. So the likelihood that we're all of a sudden going to break free into a different era is at least questionable. Now, one answer might be, well, maybe the public simply stopped caring about the environment. And this is an issue that's very hard to measure, and there are many different indicators of this. But at least if we ask one question, which is, should government do more, what do we see during this period? Well, the answer is that we don't see some major cliff in 1990 where support for doing more falls off the cliff, right? So where did this preference for environmental protection go? And my argument is that it's gone into private governance. Now people are expressing their concern for the environment in the marketplace. And we see the number of eco-labels around the world is more than 400. Many of them are eco-labels that are generated by private institutions, not by governments. And if you go into any McDonald's today, the fish that you buy is going to be Marine Stewardship Council certified. That's a private institution that's certifying the sustainability of fish caught around the world. And more than 7% of all the fish 
caught for human consumption around the world are certified by this private standard. If you go buy lumber in many places around the world, more than 15% of all the temperate forests in the world are managed pursuant to the standards of the Forest Sustainability Council, which is again a private institution that is certifying and enforcing the standards related to sustainability of forests. So toxics, do toxic chemicals fall into the same category? Well, a recent indus industry official said that the leading regulator of toxic chemicals in the United States today is not the EPA, it's Target and Walmart feeling pressure from advocacy groups and pushing standards for toxic chemicals through their supply chains. But all this wouldn't matter if this kind of behavior is just one-off behavior, is not widespread. So is it widespread? Well, our research team looked at eight sectors and the 10 companies around the world, the leading companies in these eight sectors, and we found that more than half of them, 54%, right, are regulating their supply chains. They're not required to do so by government, but they're looking for improvements throughout their supply chains through private contracting agreements. So we know that these, uh, these supply chain agreements are widespread. This private governance is widespread. And what does this mean for climate change? Well, now the important step for climate change is to make a conceptual shift. When we see comprehensive problems, we tend to think, well, what can government do? And the answer, if you're thinking about a private governance solution, is not what can government do, but what can any institution do? The actor may not be government, it may be a corporation, a nonprofit group. And our vocabulary holds us back here. It serves much like a puzzle that doesn't fit neatly into the puzzle board if our puzzle board is we need a government answer to every comprehensive problem. Right? So we use a word like policymaker. But a policymaker in this context, context might be a CFO or the head of an advocacy organization. We use words like regulation and statute, but it may be a consumer boycott or an information initiative that drives behavior change here. And we use terms like international, but the actual activity may occur at a global level, bypassing nation states altogether. So I'm gonna focus most today on industry and large corporations, which make up about a third of the US carbon share. But I wanna say a word first about households. We tend to dismiss households. Uh, we tend to think of them as 5% of the problem, and so why should we worry about them? But it turns out that the U.S. share of household carbon emissions is larger than all of the emissions of Central America, South America, and Africa combined. Just the U.S. household share. And that we studied and found that if we just do measures that are not intrusive, and in many cases include private governance steps, we can reduce the household share in the United States by roughly 20% by 2020. And you might say, well, is that important or not? Well, that's two to 300 million metric tons per year, and that's starting to get us toward that two to 3,000 million metric ton amount that I mentioned to buy a decade of carbon emissions reductions. Is that, uh, is that big? Well, here's another way to think about it, right? That's equal to all of the emissions of the country of France. So we'll have an international conference in a year at France, and what the U.S. household could contribute with private governance type initiatives is equal to France showing up at that conference and saying, okay, we're going carbon neutral. We're taking ourselves off of the table altogether. But let's turn back to my principal focus, which is on corporate behavior and how private governance can offer an opportunity here on corporate behavior. And to select these kinds of initiatives, we need criteria that help us screen out the ones that are just trivial, the public information campaigns that don't really change behavior, the top 10 lists. And what we need is prompt reductions. If we're gonna get that decade of emissions reductions, we also need reductions that are large, either individually or when scaled up among all of the different uh, types of initiatives. And then lastly, these reductions need to complement public governance. If they undermine the likelihood that we'll get public governance in the long run, then they haven't served their function. So what are the kinds of initiatives that might act here? Well, the biggest nut in the climate problem is the difference between developed and developing countries. As you can see, the black line is the growth in carbon emissions around the world that's projected in the future, and it's going up steeply. The blue line 
are the emissions from the developed or industrialized countries. And they've been high for a very long time, but they're finally beginning to level off. And then we get the developing countries. And they will make up 80% of the emissions increase over the next several decades. So they have a good argument that they should be entitled to the same kinds of uh, b benefits from the economic activity that generates carbon emissions as we were. But by the same token, if they, go up eight, if they make up that 80% share over the next several decades, we'll be in the red, red line in that, uh, in that tachometer. So what can we possibly do? Well, the international process uh, is in gridlock. But let's take a look at China for a moment. China is the world's largest emitter of carbon, and it burns half of the world's coal. And China has been a leader in doing some positive steps on climate, but it's also been a leader among the developing countries to say that there should be no binding commitments in international agreements. So the international process offers limited prospects in the near term for China. But what can we do? Well, let's think about supply chains. Supply chains and exports make up half of China's CO2 emissions. And if we look at how much the US and Europe make up of China's exports, that's 30% of China's exports. So does that matter? Well, again, that's 15% of all of China's CO2 emissions are coming from the US and Europe and supplying goods to us. And so what's the opportunity there? Well, the opportunity is to use supply chains. Walmart, for example, recently committed with a major environmental group to reduce its carbon emissions by 20 million metric tons. Walmart would be the fifth or sixth largest trading partner with China if it were a country. It has 10,000 suppliers in China. It does $18 billion a year of business with China. And what happens if Walmart insists on carbon emissions reductions from its suppliers? Now we have suppliers in China who have incentives to reduce their emissions. And they have incentives to persuade their government to provide them with ways to reduce their emissions and ultimately to change where they stand at international negotiations. So why am I optimistic about uh, these kinds of initiatives? Well, we know when asked that consumers believe that industry should change behavior even more than government. 70% of individuals when asked say that industry should do more. 60% say that private citizens should do more, and less than that think that government should do more. So we know that there's some support there. We also know, as one leading professor said, not me, uh, reputation rules. Reputation is important. Uh, so we know consumer reputation matters, even if consumers don't directly change behavior. Firms care about consumers. We also know that more than $19 trillion in investments around the world are held by investment firms that are pushing for carbon disclosure and reductions in carbon. We also know that many banks have begun to insist on disclosure of carbon emissions from their borrowers. And some banks are subject to advocacy groups who are disclosing the carbon emissions of their portfolios. And then lastly, uh, we know that employee morale matters. These employees are so happy because their company just declared that it was going carbon neutral. Um, that's not true. Uh, this is a stock slide. Uh, uh, but we do know that employee morale matters based on research that we've conducted, and perhaps most important, we know that when companies look to disclose and to reduce their carbon emissions, they find inefficiencies. So they have profit incentives to act. So how can we harness these drivers? Well, one answer is to look at what's going on right now with the Carbon Disclosure Project. It's a private institution, again, driven by that $19 trillion in investors who are looking for ways to reduce emissions from the corporate sector. And right now, it uh, insists on disclosure of carbon emissions from the largest firms around the world. And more than 300 of the S&P 500 firms are now reporting to the Carbon Disclosure Project, or CDP. But what more can be done? Well, if we want to reach into middle-sized firms and small-sized firms, then we could increase the level of reporting to include supply chains. This is called scope three reporting. And now we can go from just looking at the large firms to pushing deeper into medium and small size firms and cross international boundaries into both developed and developing countries, even in the absence of former uh, govern government action. So another opportunity. Around the world, there's growing interest in carbon labeling, often not by governments, but by private institutions. And we don't think that carbon labeling is going to induce massive amounts of behavior change. 
But if it's like other kinds of labeling, it's likely to change the mix of products that firms offer, corporations offer, restaurants offer to consumers. And for example, would you change your purchasing behavior or what you offer to your consumers if you knew what the difference is between simple choices between beef, pork, poultry, and cheese? So let's turn now, as I mentioned at the beginning, to the question of climate science, which is sweeping across all of these different areas. The green line here shows the increasing certainty expressed in government-driven climate science reports about the likelihood of human-caused climate change. But the American population hasn't changed during this period. If anything, belief in human-caused climate change has actually gone down. Democrats are about the same, and Republicans have gone down as the climate science have become more certain. Public governance doesn't seem to have a complete answer here. But again, there's a potential for a private governance solution. And what would that look like? Well, the answer might be we could put together a private climate prediction market. So you and I could buy and sell a prediction that the temperature will be what the climate scientists predict in 2020 or 2030 or 2040. And we know that markets are an area of great belief for many of the folks who are moderates and conservatives on issues related to climate change. So these may have a greater effect on those who are uncertain about climate change than many government responses. And let me wrap up with one last area. We all know instinctively that legacy matters. We know who the descendants of the Mayflower are. We know who the descendants of George Washington are. But our research team took a look at whether if you were given $100, how much of that legacy would you attribute to your reputation in your lifetime versus to your reputation after you die? And what we find is that more than $40 would be attributed to your reputation after you die. Now, why does this matter for climate change? Well, the effects of climate change won't affect us a great deal. They'll affect our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren for tens of generations. But our grandchildren will have no clue what we did once we knew what the state of the science was. But we can fix that problem. Government's unlikely to do that, but private institutions could create a database. And that database could allow you to put into the database what you did when you knew what the state of the climate science was. And so we might be able to do this electronically, as I mentioned, but we could also do it in stone, right? Now, that would be a little more expensive, uh, and we'd need the stone to be several meters above sea level, but that's an option, too. <laughs> now, let me wrap up with this. If you're a corporate CEO or the head of a, a nonprofit group, the most important step is to make that conceptual shift. When we see a large comprehensive problem like climate change, we don't simply need to say, what can government do? We need to ask whether private institutions can make a meaningful difference too, whether we can get that two to 3,000 million metric ton difference. If you're an individual consumer, recognize that your investor behavior, your consumer behavior, they all matter. And maybe if we make this conceptual shift, we'll find that we all have a legacy that we can be proud of. Thank you.